Today we are talking about a variety of subjects uh, in the legal world regarding copyright laws, where to find the laws during the lives of our ancestors, adoption laws, old and current, and the legality of a decorative marriage certificate. So it's kind of a mixed bag of tricks, but we're going to talk about all of that in this footnotes episode. And well, I like to call them footnotes because it's in the footnotes where the real sources are. And today's real source is Judy Russell. She is the legal genealogist and is legendary in the world of family history. So if you've not seen her speak, you're really in for a treat. All right, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, and factually with your family history research. Now, I had the good fortune to sit down with Judy a short time ago, and we had so much to talk about that I had to break this up into two episodes. So this is part two of a two-part series. All right, let's get started. All right, let's talk about copyright. We're going to totally change gears here. So, you know, I'm on Ancestry and I'm doing research and I'm searching around and I see someone's photograph on somebody other, some other member's tree and I want to download it for myself. Is that legal? <laughs> I'm glad you asked it that way because it gives me the opportunity to give my favorite answer, which is... It depends. Yes, I know. <laughs> In the vast majority of situations, old family photographs are out of copyright. You know, things that come from the Civil War era in the 1870s, 1880s, those are going to be out of copyright. And of course, by uploading a record voluntarily in, in a public tree, we are consenting to have other users add that to their trees. Downloading it and then re-uploading it, that's a potential problem, but more from a licensing perspective than a copyright perspective. Once you get into the more modern era, though, say, you know, late 1920s to today, now you're talking real copyright issues because the person who took that picture could very well still own or his heirs could own the copyright from a safety perspective it's always better to ask and see if you can clarify who owns the copyright let's take this one step further i've downloaded an image from 1945 World War II image of somebody's uncle in a uniform, whatever it is. And uh, I'm now going to publish a book. I'm going to sell that book for five bucks uh, to anybody who wants to buy it. And that photograph is in my book. What say you? A, a publisher probably won't publish it without proof that you Okay. are authorized to use that image. Now, copyright lasts for 70 years after the death of the photographer or the writer or the sculptor or the artist. So if so that's not necessarily the image of the person. It's it, no, it's it's who took the picture. That's the person who owns the copyright. Right. Now, if you're lucky, that's a United States government photograph. And if it is, there's a specific section of United States law that says items created for the federal government by a federal government employee, like a soldier for the army, can't be copyrighted. But if it was his buddy who took the picture in 1945 or an AP photographer who took the picture in 1945, that could still very well be copyright protected. Interesting. So we See, this is why we have you on here, because we, we learn so careful much. with this stuff. We don't need to be crazy about it. Um, right. There are fair uses of, mm -hmm. you know, if you're if you're going to 
take a snippet out of a book or a magazine article or something like that, that may very well be fair use. But 100% of somebody's image, that's hard to say that you've got authority to do it without at least investigating the, the copyright status of that image. I get a lot of comments on the YouTube channel and I'm kind of of the mindset of, hey, if you uploaded it in the first place, <laughs> consider that you're giving it to as a gift to the world because, you know, <laughs> there's no the way you're going to be able to control it. You probably can't control it unless it really is a copyrighted item, in which case you're going to have to go to court to um, enforce your copyright. So there is a risk benefit analysis to uploading. There's a risk benefit analysis to republishing something. What if you can't find the author of that article or that book, or nobody knows who took that picture? That's At that question. point, you've got to do a risk benefit analysis. How likely is it that I am going to get sued? If, if I think there's a serious potential for that, then I'm not going to do it. If I think that the chances are outrageously small that anybody is ever going to come after me, I might be willing to take that risk. But we have to be aware that there is a risk. Yeah, if uh, my uncle appeared in Life magazine in 1945, we might want to think about contacting the <laughs> the magazine to see if we can use that image. Absolutely, because they're the ones who are most likely to sue you for the copyright infringement, where if it was your aunt who took the picture of your uncle. Yes. What's the likelihood, seriously, yeah. that she's going to haul you into court for statutory damages? I mean, that's the kind of risk benefit analysis we have to do. So let's yeah. talk about uh, public domain. Public domain is fabulous. Yes. So let's define it because it's not a physical location the way some people think. Public domain is the legal status of not being copyright protected. So if the copyright has expired, it's in the public domain now. You can do anything you want within reason I often use the example that it's probably not a good idea to use the out of copyright photograph of a living person for commercial purposes without getting that living person's permission. Um, and I definitely wouldn't use it to like advertise a porn site or something. <laughs> Let's be reasonable here. I so know. If, it's, if it's expired, it's public domain. If it was never copyrighted, because for many years, there were formalities. You had to put a copyright notice on it. You had to register it with the copyright office. And if you never did those things, then a photo taken in the, a published photo in 1930 might very well never have been copyrighted. Now, I want to think the copyright laws changed recently like a couple of well, years ago. The, the thing that changed recently, thank heavens it changed recently, is that the, the way that the copyright law is set up every year on January 1st, we should get a year of material going out of copyright into the public domain. Thanks to the Walt Disney Company and Sonny Bono, that clock was stopped to protect the copyright on the first Mickey Mouse cartoon. And it meant that nothing passed into the public domain for years and years and years. It just stopped dead. And all of us who were watching this were kind of holding our breath mm -hmm. as December 2018 ticked down to see whether Congress was going to step in and stop the clock again. It didn't. And so on January 1, 2019, a whole year worth of material came into the public domain. And on January 1st, 2020, January 1st, 
2021. And unless Congress fouls it up, <laughs> it's going to continue <laughs> every year. We will get one more year of material. So what is that time frame? As of right now, it is anything published before 1926. On January 1, 2022, it will be anything published before 1927. And it keeps moving up. So it's 75 years, more than that, actually. It's 90 some odd years, but it's 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 moving again. Yeah. It didn't for the longest time. Well, that's fabulous. It's good stuff. And yeah. there's some great things. You know, Omar Khayyam's The Prophet, which many of us memorized as a as a poem in school, right. came into the public domain. The first Cecil B. DeMille version of, of Moses parting the Red Sea finally came into the to the public domain. So there are really cool old things that are now absolutely free for us to use with no copyright concerns at all. That is, isn't that anything, great? Anything created by a federal employee for the federal government. So you think of, you go onto the website of the Fish and Wildlife Service, go to their photograph collection and anything that was taken by a Fish and Wildlife Service employee for the service is absolutely free for us to use. Park Service, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Space Administration, those are all not copyrightable. So there's good stuff that's available and we don't have to worry about copyright one bit. All right. I want to switch gears again. <clears throat> I, I got your head spinning now, I'm sure. <laughs> so let's talk about court records in general. If somebody wants to look for um, any kind of court record, really, where, where should they go? Family search. Start there. And we do it for a lot of reasons. The first is it's free. Mm -hmm. Genealogists like free. The second thing is that unless we're planning on living forever, all of us have got the t-shirt that says, too many ancestors, too little time. <laughs> so we have to prioritize our, our research planning. Mm -hmm. And if I can get something for free online, then I'm not gonna worry about trying to get to that little courthouse in that little community half a continent away. So I want to start and see what's available on Family Search, and remember that they went through all bunches of those little courthouses right up till today, getting the probate records and the the court records and the circuit courts and the coroner's records and all kinds of law related documents. Even if they were doing that in the 1950s, they were taking microfilm of things certainly up to the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. So through roughly 1900. If I can get that online, that's my first stop. My second stop, and again, I'm going to do this before I ever go on a research trip. I'm going to check with the local genealogical society, genealogical library, historical society, who holds those records today. Because a number of the older records have been moved to archival preservation at a state archives or a municipal archives or a county archives. Doesn't make sense going to the courthouse if you can't get to the records. So where are they today? Chances are my next stop is going to be the state archives. My last stop is usually the courthouse itself for those records that are still kept at the courthouse. Yeah, especially the older court records have probably been moved to the state archives. A lot of them have. Now, yeah. that's not true everywhere. Yeah. There are a lot of jurisdictions that have held on to their records assiduously, but a lot of them have been moved. As, as you're a fellow North Carolina researcher, you know the depth of goodies that are held at the North Carolina State Archives. Anybody who's been to the Library of Virginia knows the enormous 
reels and reels of microfilm of, of old historical records held by the Library of Virginia. So we need to find out what's the, if I've got 14 Virginia counties to research, I'm better off going to the Library of Virginia than to 14 county courthouses. So true. If someone wants to understand the laws of a time, and I know it depends <laughs> on where we are and what era we're talking about, but if somebody wants to figure out, I don't know, what laws were enacted in 1860, how do they go about that discovery? Okay, the, the first thing that I would do is to use a resource which I think is way too often overlooked, again, by genealogists, and that's Cindy's list. Oh, yeah. Because in her state categories, for every state, there's a link for laws and statutes. And she has gone through to see what she's been able to find of collections of laws and statutes that may be on Hottie Trust or Internet Archive or Google Books or maintained by the state library or the state archives in as many jurisdictions as she's been able to find. So that's an enormous leg up. Good tip. The other thing is to get familiar with the search technology at the digitized book services, Google Books, Internet Archive, Hottie Trust, and do a time-limited search for the statutes of the time and place. Acts, laws, statutes, whatever. And there's one more tip that may help. It's not going to work 100%. But in the law, there's something called a treatise. And a treatise is a guide to an area of the law written by a lawyer or a judge or a law professor for money. They're trying to explain an area of the law to their fellow lawyers and judges, et cetera, but to lawyers and judges who don't know about that part of the law. So if you can find a treatise on the law of infants, meaning children, in Ohio in 1860, that's gonna give you a complete overview of laws involving children in that jurisdiction. Or it may be one that's you know, infants in the Midwest or in the Northeastern states, or a law of, you know, the law of evidence or the law of probate, any area of the law. If you can find a treatise it's probably going to be written in a way where you can follow, get an overview, and almost all of them have got footnotes to the original sources, the statutes, the other things. I love footnotes. <laughs> we all love footnotes. <laughs> so would that be a simple Google search? Like yep. treatise, treatise for, yeah. Treatise, Virginia, law, evidence. Excellent. And hopefully something will pop up. Next, we're talking about old and current adoption records. So stick around. I just wanted to remind you though that Genealogy TV has a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. And all of that information is in the show notes below. Also know there is a handout for this episode. We'll talk more about that at the end of the show. All right, let's talk about adoption records. Let's say I, <clears throat> I was working with somebody the other day who had she was actually trying to find adoption records from 1908. So this person clearly has passed away. They're no longer around, not a living person. Do you think those adoption records are uh, available somewhere? It depends. <laughs> we kind of have to understand that, first of all, adoption is a relatively recent legal item. The first laws on adoption didn't get passed in the United States until Massachusetts in the 1850s. So before then, you'd get individual cases of somebody taking a person as their heir so that they would have somebody to pass an estate down to. But generally, it was unofficial and informal. Maybe a guardianship situation. Instead. That would be the most you would get. Yeah. 
once the adoption statutes came around, for the longest time, nobody ever considered closing those records. They were simply court records like any other court records, and they were perfectly public. It wasn't until the 19-teens, 1920s, that people started getting the idea of, well, we want to, we want to protect the adoptive parents from having the uh, birth parents show up on their doorstep. We, we don't want the child to know the child is adopted because it's easier to assimilate into the family. That's when they started closing the adoption records. So a couple of questions come into play. Did the statute of that jurisdiction close the records retroactively? A lot of them did not. So before okay. the closure, those records are in the open court records. If they did, then question number two is, have they reopened any of those records? And we're seeing more and more today, the move to reopen adoption records on the theory. And I think the absolutely valid theory that everybody is entitled to know their own heritage. And I think DNA may have had a, a play in that too, you know? It's... If, if you can't hide it, then, you know, it, it's one of those, if you can't fight it, you might as well join it type of situation. Yeah. And at least with, with going along with it, you may be able to steer the way it's handled and perhaps make it a little easier for the adoptive parent. And the, and the biological parent, both of whom may have thought that this was going to be a secret their whole lives. Right. Any advice for adoptees today that are looking for their biological parents besides doing the DNA work, which clearly is. Well, over. the DNA work is, is the best. The other thing is to join together with the adoption rights advocacy organizations to try to get as many original birth records and original adoption records unsealed as possible. But I think everybody else talks about, you know, how to do it, the rights of the adoptee and all of that stuff. My caution would be, think about what you're doing and what your expectations are, because the fairy tale that you're the prince or the princess doesn't come true all the time in real life. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not always a happy ending. It's, it's really not always a happy ending. And in fact, sometimes knowing can be worse than not knowing. And you need to think about that. And I, I think in any case where it's particularly emotional, where you're, starting to feel like I've got to find out. That's probably the time to talk to a counselor and, and yeah. come to terms with your expectations so that there isn't a total letdown if the other side does not want contact. There are so many sides to that story. My mother was adopted. And so I'm very familiar with, um, how, you know, and I, I discovered her biological family before DNA was even um, even around, but I think a lot of people don't realize that the impact is not just on the adoptee or the parents, but there are maybe siblings involved. There may be a lot of other family dynamics and, and there's so many different relationships that are kind of two way streets in different. I mean, I, I know I totally get the need to understand the biological family because I lived it, but there's also, you know, we really need to think twice about uh, the ramifications of, of the discovery. Blaine Bettinger, I think, says it best when he says, we all have a right to know who our families are, but we don't have a right to a relationship. And that's true even in a perfectly intact biological family. There are fissures that develop in those families and that you can't force somebody to want to be in your life. Yes, that's so and, true. And there's an, 
I think a, an expectation that gets blown out of proportion in in some cases, and it's a real it's a real setback. To the adoptee, it feels like being rejected twice. And you don't know why. You don't know yeah. that perhaps it's because the spouse of your biological parent is, is resistant or they haven't told the other children or what the factors are. You just yeah. don't know. All right. So I want to show you something. I have been working on this story, and I don't know if you heard about the story or not, about the um, 1872 marriage certificate found in a thrift shop. But I'm going to show you this uh, this image. So this is, I'm assuming you can see that. I can. This is an image of this marriage certificate. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it really well. This was found in a thrift shop nearby. And uh, they posted it on Facebook and said, you know, they were looking for anybody that could help with this. Uh, this was just too much fun. Uh, it was, it was not far from my home. So I got very much involved in it. And three days later, I solved the mystery and this certificate has now gone back to, uh, a descendant of this married couple. Now, my question for you is as the legal genealogist, these certificates, this is a marriage certificate from 1872 in, uh, actually in New Jersey, uh, Bordentown, New Jersey. Yep. And my question is, since this is clearly a form that was filled out by the minister, how legal is this document as a standalone document? You know, the, the reality is that we're talking the 1870s and we're talking a time period when licensing is starting to become important as both evidence of intent to marry and then the return being the proof of the marriage. So what you would do in a situation like this to determine whether this is legal, you know, it's, it's clearly evidence of a marriage. Correct. Whether the marriage took place legally is going to depend on the forms of the jurisdiction at the time. It, every jurisdiction anywhere in the United States allowed the solemnization of marriages by ministers. Some of them limited, limited it to ministers of one faith and said others couldn't. But right. by 1872, it's basically any minister, any rabbi, any justice of the peace could solemnize the marriage. Now, whether it also had to be recorded would be another story. But if they followed the forms, and this appears that they did, there's no reason why that wouldn't be a legal marriage. Very the next good. question is, is it evidence? And it absolutely is. It's you know, anything that we have, including a note from the bride to her sister in California saying, Johnny and I ran off and got married yesterday. From a genealogical perspective, that's evidence. Now, I know that a lot of these ministers kept like a registry, like because they might be riding on horseback for two counties away, you know, in the middle of a snowstorm to return these these marriages. And he might have a registry. And maybe that's the only thing that has survived. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so, you know, the thought process there is, well, that's evidence of a marriage, but it's not really, doesn't prove necessarily that the marriage, I guess it would yeah, from a genealogical standpoint, but maybe not necessarily from a legal standpoint. Well, I think from a legal standpoint, that would be accepted because okay. it's the closest contemporary record to the time. Um, and, you know, the reality is, and we sometimes forget this, that recordation as a qualification for something being legal isn't even 100% true today. <laughs> you know, if, if you're in Pennsylvania, just as one example, there is no legal requirement that you file a copy or record a copy of your deed. Now, the truth is you are never gonna get title insurance 
if the chain of deeds hasn't been recorded. Right. So everybody does it, but not because it's legally required, but because there are benefits if you do file it. Good point. So I think we need to, to keep that in mind when we talk about recorded documents and evidence that is good evidence, but isn't recorded. Yeah, well, obviously, in the case of this marriage certificate, uh, this was the document that was given to the bride and groom, most likely as kind of a keepsake uh, document. And I guess that would, if they ever had to show that they were married, they could show that. This was fa- found in the back of a painting. Yeah, uh, it is, is whether there is a better record. Because we have in, in the law... And I think it it spills over into genealogy, something called the best evidence rule. Mm -hmm. What would be the best evidence of this marriage? It would be a marriage return filed in the county of the marriage within a short time after the marriage, conforming to all of the, the legal requirements. So now what if the courthouse burns? The best evidence is going to be that equally contemporaneous, but private record that was given to the bride and the groom. And if they had lost that or they'd lost it in a flood or nobody ever got that back to the family, then the next best evidence might be a newspaper report that said, you know, Jackie and Johnny got married yesterday. So it's it's a sliding scale of what is the best evidence. You're in a community with very good records, no courthouse fires, everything's been preserved. You want the original record. Yes. If you happen to be researching in the South, where my mother's family is from, you're lucky if you've got a note written on a scrap paper. True. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us today. And um, hopefully we'll get you back on one of these days soon. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Connie. Hey, you can learn more about Judy Russell in her blog post at thelegalgenealogist.com. I'm telling you, that blog post really has some great material in it. All right, there was more to this conversation than what you saw today in part one. So if you haven't seen part one, it's about wills and estates and the women's rights and laws around what women were allowed to do, whether they were allowed to buy land or whatever. So uh, we're going to talk more about that uh, in the previous episode. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. There is a handout for this episode. If you want to join the channel membership, you can hit the join button and join at the information access level channel membership. And then you can find the handouts in the community tab once you're a member. You can also get the handouts over at uh, my Patreon page, uh, the patrons at the happy dance level or higher. That's at patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. And you can find the handouts over at genealogytv.org. All right. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.